So consider this my fireside chat about the dangers of this type of work. There is a man named Jason Moss. I did not know him personally, but when I was a teenager, I read his book called The Last Victim. Uh, when I was a teenager, I would just kind of like pick an aisle randomly and pick a book, and that happened to be the book I picked because um, I was a weird little child, and now I'm a real weird little adult. <laughs> Um, so this book was called The Last Victim. And it's a UNLV student who decided to strategically communicate with serial killers. Um, there are certain people who develop parasocial relationships with serial killers and write to them in prison. Um, he had a different intention. He did write to them, but in order to try and get inside their head, he decided to write them not as himself, but as their perfect victim. He wrote to John Wayne Gacy, Richard Ramirez, uh, many other individuals, some of the most notorious ones uh, in the history of serial killers. And, you know, he developed this kind of psychological profile of, you know, like, who were the people these serial killers targeted? What were their defining characteristics? Um, what were these people looking for? And from that, he was able to construct this profile and get lots of results, which at first seems amazing, given the volume of fan mail that serial killers get. This person was not only able to reach them, but get through to them in a way that facilitated dialogue. And he got to peer into the mind of serial killers. I read another thing, which I just want to kind of throw in there to put things into context. Forensic psychologists who have encountered actual sociopaths and psychopaths have a visceral reaction to them. To some people, uh, the hairs on their back stand up. There's something in them, these forensic psychologists, that recognizes they're in the presence of a predator. So. Jason Moss may not have had that visceral experience, but he got to peer into the mind of numerous serial killers. But he got a glimpse of that, and he got a very strong taste of that. And uh, I'd like to commend him for his work uh, and the new insights it brought into the, the psychology of the serial killer, but he killed himself not too long after the book was published. That darkness can seep into you without you even recognizing it. You could think you're relatively well adjusted and you're doing fine, and you're on top of things, and then one day, out of nowhere, you are just paralyzed by depression and, and feeling inconsolable. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, something I experienced, you know, I was uh, lying next to my boyfriend at the time, and he was sleeping, and I was about to go to sleep, uh, and I went to go hug him, and in that moment, I just felt so profoundly disconnected from him and myself that I felt more lonely in that bed than if I was actually alone. Uh, there's just weird things that this darkness does. And I'm not saying that every extremist or someone toying with content and sharing 
memes and trying to harm people in that way is a psychopath or a sociopath, but the darkness is comparable. You're not talking to well-adjusted individuals. You're not talking to people who have their life figured out. You're talking to people who are looking for someone to blame, looking to harm others, and looking to lash out at the world. Like, there's anger and there's pain. And then a lot of the times when you learn about them, when you talk to him, as I've talked to many different Proud Boys in the course of my research, you see the societal conditions that are, they're not addressed. You know, they're not helping people. Like you're seeing all these people who fall through the cracks. And you want to help them, but you have to save yourself first, right? How can you help people see there are healthy alternatives to the ideology they've embraced if you're falling apart if you're miserable if you're so exhausted by the nature of your research that you can barely hold a conversation with them how is that going to help them see there's something better so Word of advice, uh, if you want to take it, helpers. Think to the example I gave of Jason Moss and his very tragic story. And think about the people that you want to help. You have to figure out what it is that gives your life true happiness and meaning. You have to know who you can reach out to in times of need. You have to know what it is that gives you peace. And you have to know who you can talk to when you feel like you can get no peace. And that the world is falling apart. And you are totally atomized and alone. I don't want to say pick up a hobby. For me, dancing is my big passion. That's how I am able to continue my research. That's how I've been able to persist against all of the things associated with my research. Uh, and I hope that you find what that is. I hope that you take time offline to see what that is. I hope you have your community that you can talk to, reach out to, and not just online, but in-person meetings. Socializing in that way is so important. I hope that you prioritize your self-care and you don't get it confused with consumerism or buying some expensive bath product. It's not like you can't do that, you know. <laughs> uh, we all need to be clean and focus on our basic hygiene and all that. But don't think that a product will save your life. Or make you love yourself. The people that you want to help helpers they've bought a product that is not helping them they don't want to see it yet they don't yet have buyer's remorse in order for you to help them you have to understand what it is that genuinely makes you happy that makes you smile like the fucking viagra man <laughs> you have to find out what that is for yourself and you have to take breaks from this work it's not laziness it's not that you're not producing you're not going to miss out by taking an hour or so out of your day the emails will be there the dms will be there the phone calls will be there take care of your
I've started an August challenge. It's from an exercise called The Artist's Way. Uh, I do have a small group on Patreon for people who want to sign up for that challenge, but really, it's something that you can do for yourself. Um, so here's the rules. Only rules. Every morning, when you first wake up, take out sheets of paper and a pencil or pen and free write. No self-editing, no corrections, no crossing anything out, literally whatever comes to your mind. And it might be really weird at first to get it out and it might be really hard to finish that but you get into a flow of things. It's like exercise. Like the first five or ten minutes just suck. And then you start feeling really good. And it's getting to that point where you feel really good that makes you want to do that again. So this is a daily practice. It's called Morning Pages or 750 Words, which is the equivalent of three uh, pieces of paper. Fill those out for yourself. Just think, think of making it a daily habit and check back with me in a month. I'd like to see if this helps you because this is something that has definitely helped me and it's something that gets you to tap into what's called metacognition, thinking about your own thinking. Help you begin to address some of the disconnects that you see in your own life. So with that, I think I will end my fireside chat. And I really hope that you give it a shot and see what happens. So, take care of yourselves. Have a good night.